an honor to be able to stand up here and preach the Word of God. I'm thankful for a, a church, a pastor, that allows me to stand up here. You know, we joke about ladies speaking or women preachers, but I know the real reason why y'all enjoy it when I share is because you get to eat lunch earlier. You know it's true. You know it's true. It's going to be shorter today. That's my style. That's how I roll. I have certain things that the Lord puts on my heart. In fact, this message has been kind of ruminating. I've been ruminating on it for weeks, and it's just been building on the inside, and it's been quite a while since I've stood up here and shared the words. So I'm really glad to be back sharing what God has put on my heart. So I'm just thankful to you, Father, that you're going to open the eyes of our understanding while we read your word. So today we're going to talk about seeking God, how you can begin to truly live. And we're going to be looking at Amos 5. So if you'll open the word to Amos 5 this morning. I was talking to Todd um, earlier this week, and if you, if you think about the times that you have shared God's word, is there a persistent theme you know, I think we all have a message that God has given us. You know, Pastor Les, he talks about the Word. Get in the Word. You know, he may preach on other things, but he, he always comes back to that. Get in the Word and walk in love. Those are his two themes. And so I just I want to drop that in your heart this week, even before I start. Think about what the message that God has put in your heart, the message that he has put for you to declare. You know, John the Baptist, it was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's given you a message to bring to the world. And so Amos 5 is one of the messages that God has put on my heart. In fact, I've shared on this scripture so many times over the years, but this is one of the key scriptures in my life. So Amos 5 verses 4 through the first part of verse 6 says, For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me. And live, but do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. Amen? So we're going to talk about this morning seeking God. Now, I've broken this down into just about three points, and I know it's cliche for someone to have a three-point sermon, but there's certain things I want you to walk away with. And so we're going to talk about what does it mean to seek, we're going to talk about whom do we seek, and we're going to talk about what happens when we seek. So those are basically three parts that we're going to talk about this morning. So first we're going to talk about what does it mean to seek. What does it mean to seek? Now in the Word of God, the Bible uses the, the word seek, um, Bakash, which means to diligently search until an object is located. It can mean to beg or beseech or to pray. And so this is a word that's commonly used throughout the Bible in the Psalms and in other scriptures about seeking. How many of you have ever lost something and you can't find it? Zeke and Isaac, it used to make me laugh because they'd say, Mama, where's such and such? And I'd say, have you looked for it? Well, no, it's lost. Well, isn't that the point of looking for something when it's lost? And there's usually one person in the house that's the finder. Usually it's mom. Mom knows where everything is. So she's the go-to person. Mom wears such and such. Mom wears this. Where's that? So in the Bible, it does talk about this specific aspect of seek is to search until an object is located. But in Amos, there's a different word that's used. In Amos, it's darash which is to tread or frequent. In the primitive root of the word, it means to tread or frequent, to follow for pursuit or to worship. So it's a little bit different than I'm looking for an object. Oh, there it is. I found it. This is a continual, frequent, pursuing, and following. Because how many of us know that God can never be fully attained? There's too much of God to just look for one time, and that's it. Every time I seek God about something, there's more of him that I see. When he revealed himself to Abraham, he would say, I'm Jehovah Jireh, I'm your provider. But then another time, he was El Shaddai, 
Or another time, he's Jehovah Rapha. God is continually revealing who he is. So I believe that's why in this word, in Amos, it's to tread or to frequent. This is somewhere where we should continuously go. This isn't a one-time thing, to tread. This is a place where you should walk frequently, seeking God, pursuing God. Your God hides himself. Did you know that? And the Bible says that he, re he reveals his secrets to his prophets. So God is saying to Israel, seek me and live. So let's look at a couple other scriptures today that has that same word, that same derash, to tread or frequent. Frequent, we're going to look up in Isaiah 55, 6. We're going to really get into the word today. The word of God is living and is powerful. So we're going to look at about four scriptures where this same Hebrew word is used. So Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So there is, you know, Todd was talking about, I think it was last week, Pastor Todd preached about an appointed time, a time for something. There's an appointed time when God can be found. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So let's look, go ahead and look too in um, Psalm 69, 32. David uses this same word talking about seeking or looking. Psalm 69, 32 says, The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek God, your heart shall live. So David reiterates, well, in fact, David said it first, And you who seek God, your heart shall live. And then in Psalm 34, 10, same word for seek is used, Psalm 34, 10. I think this is the second part of the verse. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall lack what? Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. If you seek God, the Bible promises you that you're not going to lack any good thing. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And turn a little bit over again in Psalm 910. Same word for seek. Darash, to tread or frequent, to follow for pursuit. David uses that here in Psalm 910. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you, those who are following, those who are pursuing, those who are seeking God. The Bible says he will not forsake you. So let's think about this Amos 5 again. In Amos 5, it's actually written in the form of a, a funeral dirge, which is a funeral song. It's a lamentation. Amos and even God is lamenting over Israel. Amos considers that Israel is already dead. And God says, I'm weary of your sacred assemblies and feast days. If you look at the verse, he tells them, do not seek Bethel which means house of God, nor enter Gilgal, that's an ancient shrine, nor pass over to Beersheba, that's a place of pilgrimage. God is saying, don't seek these things. Don't seek these ancient shrines. Don't seek these religious locations. Just seek me. Amen. Just seek me. God wants us to not seek these religious places that will appease us. You ever heard somebody say, and I can understand, I don't say this critically, I can understand because church is a refuge. But sometimes people say, I got to hear a sermon Sunday so I can make it through the week. God is saying, just seek me. Just seek me and you'll live. Just seek me. He was tired of their religious ceremonies. He was tired of their assemblies. Later on in the, in the chapter, he was tired of their feast days. He's, he was crying out. God is crying out. Just seek me and you will live. Just seek me. So he's still...
that out today. He's still crying out to his church. Just look for me. So if we look at the English definition of the word seek, and also the etymology, do you all know what the etymology of a word is? E-T-Y-M-O-L-O-G-Y. That's the origin of a word, where the English word gets its origin. And English comes from so many different languages. Uh, we get a lot of our words from Latin. We get a lot of our words from Greek. We get some from Old English. So etymology is, is the, the actual origin of the word. So if we look at the etymology of the word seek, it actually comes from our Old English word, sakan. If, we, if you read Old English, none of us would understand it. It doesn't look anything like English. But it means also to inquire or pursue or long for or desire or expect from. Did you know that your desires are very closely related to what you seek? Your desires are very closely related to what you seek. And I started thinking about that this week. Just in a practical means, when you open that refrigerator door, you're hungry. And you're looking for something to eat. You're desiring food. You're desiring what we seek and search for on a daily basis is closely related to. You can look at that and you can tell what your desires are. So I question myself, do I desire God? Is that where and whom I'm seeking every day? So even in the English, old English word, the meaning of the word seek, it means to long for or desire or expect from. Do we really come to God expecting anything? Do we come in this church service ready to go, our spirits on fire because we are expecting from God? That's what I want. So you can take um, the words in Amos, seek me, and you can, feel, you can feel God in some of the blanks of the, of the English definition. You know, inquire God, pursue God, long for God, expect from God. These are, this is what we should be doing. Seek me and you shall live. Inquire God, pursue God, long for God, expect from God. That's what it means to seek. So now let's talk about this, our second um, aspect. Whom do you seek? Let's look at John chapter 20. So we've established what it means to seek. You know, if you look in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew word it means to tread or frequent, to follow or pursue. And even in the Old English it carries that same meaning to inquire, pursue, or long for a desire. But now let's look at whom, whom do you seek? And in John chapter 20, we all know this story. This is the story after the resurrection of Christ. But Mary comes to the tomb and she's seeking someone. So in verse 11 it says, John chapter 20, But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things. So whom was Mary seeking? She was, she was seeking Jesus. She came to the tomb. She was looking. But you won't find Jesus among the dead things. You won't find Jesus in the tomb because Jesus doesn't live among the dead things. He was he who was dead, but now he's alive. See, sometimes I'm looking for Jesus in what I, I'm, Amos talks about in the religious things or the... That's not, you're not going to find him in dead things. That's not where he resides. So she came and was looking, and he wasn't in the tomb. And she was weeping, and, you know, he said, you know, whom are you seeking? And, and she said, you know, if you know where he is, tell me. And he said her name. 
Mary. And there must have been something. She didn't recognize him, obviously. There must have been something about the way he said her name. Because revelation came all over her, and she knew it was Jesus. And so, whom are we seeking? You know, Mary was seeking Jesus, and she found him. The Bible says, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Yeah, you know, whom are we seeking? I promise you, if you seek Jesus, you're going to find him. And notice what happened to her after she found Jesus. He gave her a message. Do not cling to me, for I have not ascended. He said, go to my brethren and say to them. You know, when you spend time with Jesus, he's going to give you a message. You know, there are many times, I'll admit it, there's in your life, I'm so busy, there's so many things to do, and I don't seek the Lord the way that I desire. Well, I'm not going to have a message. I'm not going to have a word. Because you have to be with the word to get a word. And it's like in the book of Acts when the apostles, you know, the Pharisees knew they were not educated men, but it, it, in the book of Acts it said that the Pharisees knew that the apostles had been with Jesus. They knew they had been with Jesus. So when you're with Jesus, you have a message to share, and everybody else is going to know. They may not recognize your education, your pedigree. They may not recognize, you know, all these different accolades, but they'll know one thing about you. He's been with Jesus, or she's been with Jesus. So whom do you seek? Are you seeking Christ? Don't seek him among the dead things. Now, I'm not negating coming to church. We need to come together and fellowship. We need each other. In this hour, in this dark day, we need each other. But there will come a day when everybody that walks in this door, they'll be so full of the Spirit, they already got a message. You know, Paul said when, to come in, you know, one will, one will have a song. And when we come together, we should all be ready and have a message to share, a message to bring, because we're already full when we get here. And I believe in the last days, that's the way it's going to be. Because we've been with Jesus. He is raising up a remnant who only want him. I can see it in, in the Christians that I know. I can, I can see people's hearts that I've been praying for for years. They're saying, April, I'm hungry for God like I've never been hungry before. He's raising up a remnant of people who only want him. So whom are you seeking? Are you seeking Jesus? Because if you're seeking him, you will find him. And when you meet with him, when you have an encounter with Christ, you're going to have a message to share. And so many people that Jesus healed, they went about and told everybody what he did. So God has, and I had mentioned that before, about kind of a scripture or a message that he had put on my heart that I always come back to. Well, we all have that. God has given you a specific message for Christ, for the body of Christ and for the world. You, only you. It's your message to bring. Because you're chosen, you're called. He has a specific part for each one of us. But we've got to be with him. We've got to spend time with him to get that message. So whom do you seek? I'm seeking Christ. Uh, in Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, Then you will seek me. And I love Amplified. It says, Inquire for and require me as a vital necessity. And you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. He said, if you seek me, and this must be an point at a particular time, then you will seek me. You ever come to that point in your life? Then you will seek me. And you will inquire of me. And you will require me. The longer I've been saved, the more I know that I need him. I need him every day. I need him every step of the day. I had somebody ask me, do you pray about everything? Yeah. You don't? I have to. Because the more I know him, the more I realize I don't know. And I realize I need him every day. I need his wisdom. Because in life, there are so many, and I try to tell my children this, there are so many little decisions that you can make that could be foolish, that could change the entire course of your life. One decision can change your whole life. I want to walk in the wisdom of God. I want all my decisions you know, there was a story about a, a man or a woman, I can't remember, uh, at 9-11, who was a Christian and said that particular morning felt very strongly not to go to work. We all have that, that the spirit just begins to stir our hearts about something. We've got to listen to those unctionings of the Holy Spirit. 
to this particular person, took the day off. That would seem a very inconsequential decision, but not that day. That day, this individual is alive because he or she decided to listen to the voice of the Lord. I need him every step of the way, every day. And so seek him. I just want to stir your heart today. Seek him. Seek him. And he says in Jeremiah 29, then you will seek me. Then you're going to inquire. You're going to require me as a vital necessity. And you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. And that word find means, it doesn't necessarily just mean you're going to find it and obtain it. It means appear. You know, God's going to appear in your life when you seek him. It means exist or meet or be present. See, it's not that God has moved from his location and you have to find him. You moved. So he's saying when you seek me, this word find means you're going to meet with me. I was already existing here. And you're going to meet with me. You're going to see that I am already present in your situation. See, many times he's already in the situation, but you just don't see it. So when you seek him you find him you realize that he is already there he appears in your situation so he says when you seek you will find and that's a promise of him so that's also the next point what happens when you seek and that's one of the things that happens when you seek God he says you will find me that's a promise and that's a promise that I stand on every day I was praying Uh, last night about a situation with my older children and I said God your word says that when I call upon you that you will answer me the Bible says that when I pray he hears that's his promise so it's not a and I'm so thankful it's not a futile pursuit it's not something that I'm not sure what the consequences will be no he says seek me and you will find me But the great thing about God, and Les says this a lot, he does exceedingly, abundantly above all that you could ask, hope, or think of because he says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, give you a hope and a future and an expected end. That's what he has for you. So when we seek him, he does not only what you're asking, he does above He does above what you could ever think or hope or dream of. He's a God of more. He's an abundant God. So this is, this is my, the next scripture I want to share is the second thing that he does when you seek him. Number one is you're going to find him. This is what to expect. What happens when I seek him? Number one, you find him. Number two, he says, I will show you great and mighty things of which you did not know. Now you talk about your jam. Jeremiah 33, 3 is my jam. That's my scripture. We all have a scripture that we live by. This is my jam. This is my scripture that I, my passwords are Jeremiah 33.3. My logins to stuff is Jeremiah 33.3. That's where I stand on God's word. And he says in Jeremiah 33.3, I'm reading it in Amplified, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. And Amplified says fenced in and hidden which you did not know, you did not distinguish and recognize, and you had no knowledge of or understood. So call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things of which you did not know. Now that word call is not just a simple, oh Lord. It is cry out, address, shout, proclaim. You are trying to get someone's attention. You are getting God's attention. Hey God, it's like Hannah when she came before God She said, oh, Lord, remember me. Now, did God have amnesia? No. But she was saying, hey, some, and I feel this so strongly in prayer at times, in intercessory prayer. I am drawing his attention to something. I am waving my flag. I'm saying, here I am, God, remember me. If I have ever found favor in your sight, God, remember your handmaiden. Remember me, oh, Lord. You're crying out. And I remember my mother told me that. Every situation, her advice was always just pray about it. So, which is frustrating sometimes when you want to hear something else, but that's her, just pray, that's her default. Just pray about it, April. But she had told me, when you cry out to God, something's going to break in your life, and you can feel it. And I know that to be 
situations that I have prayed about. But when I got to the point, it's kind of like that word, then you will call upon me. When I get to that point where I said, okay, and I cried out to God, there was a moment when I knew that I had penetrated the gates of heaven and God had heard me. So when you call, you are crying out, you are addressing, you are shouting, you are getting God's attention. But it also means to name something. You need to name it. Now, not name it in the natural. You need to name it in the spiritual. You need some spiritual eyes. You need to stop complaining about your situation. You need to stop complaining about the people in your lives. You need to name it. And so when you get before God, you need to say, God, I believe that so-and-so is saved. I believe that so-and-so is walking in your kingdom. I know the gifts and callings you have for that person. They will be accomplished. You need to start naming something in the heavenlies because you know what? God gives names to things. He gives names to people. You know, in, in Samson, he revealed, that he revealed it to Samson's parents. He revealed it to Hannah that his name would be Samuel. God names things. In fact, names are very important. God reveals himself through his name. So when you're in a situation, you need to start naming it. That's what this word call means. It occurs more than 700 times in the Bible, so apparently it's important. Call, call out to God. And so when we call out to him, you know, he says, I'm going to answer you and show you great and mighty things. Now, this is, to me, is the exciting part. The Amplified says, fenced in and hidden, something you did not know, something you didn't distinguish, something you didn't recognize, something you didn't have understanding of. The word is butsar in, in the Hebrew, and it means isolated, inaccessible revelation or insight did you know that when you call upon him he will give you classified information god is going to give you information that you shouldn't know he's going to give you information that's uncommon wisdom he's going to show you things that you should not have knowledge of when you call upon him there are times that god has shown me in the spirit when i've been praying he has shown me in advance the plans that the enemy had he has shown me in advance the strategy of the enemy, what the enemy was going to do. And he showed me that so that I could intercede and pray. See, God doesn't always want us on the defensive. He wants us to move in an offensive way. So God wants to show you things that you normally wouldn't have access to, information that you shouldn't know. I remember one night, Todd, woke, well, that next morning he woke up and he said, I heard... Last night, I heard a, the conversation between two angels. And I said, what? He said, I heard the conversation between two angels. God was revealing to Todd something that he would not normally have access to. This morning when we were worshiping and saying, holy, 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 I felt this rush come in. And I felt it so much so that it, I had chills. And it wasn't because I was cold because I was up here sweating. I felt chills all over me, and I knew that our holy, holy had got the attention of the angels. There are angels all around. There's angels in this room. There's angels that are in position all over this city. We've prayed them here. The hosts of heaven are in an area. Like Todd said, there's more angels than demons. So I knew when we were singing holy, holy, I felt the rush. And I felt, I just knew in my spirit, there was an angel that went, because they recognized the sound of heaven, and they love the glory of God. And God will show you things in the spirit that you would not normally have access to. And so you can see this, you say, well, April, okay, those are great examples, but show me something in the Word. Well, I'm going to read out of 1 Kings chapter 18. This is about Elijah. He had... Throughout First and Second Kings, he had a tremendous amount of information. God, he was a prophet that God showed him. But in First Kings eighteen, verse forty-one, you know, there's been a drought in Israel, and Elijah's been doing battle with Jezebel and Ahab. He's been prophesying. He's been receiving revelation from the Lord. But in verse 41, it says, Then Elijah said to Ahab, this is, that's the king, Go up 
for there's the sound of the abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. And he said to a servant, Go up, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And seven times he said, Go again. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. So it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. And Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So Elijah went up to the mountain, and he told Ahab, There's the sound of the abundance of rain. And Ahab was probably like, What? The sound of rain? I don't hear rain. But Elijah heard it before anybody else heard it. He went up to the mountain, put his face between his knees. He was on the mountain seeking God and praying. And he knew even before this small hand rose up out of the sea that God was going to send rain. How did Elijah know that? Because Elijah was seeking God and God was showing him great and mighty things. See, I'm ready to hear the sound of heaven. So many times in our lives, we are so attuned to the sound of this earth, to the sound of our situation, even to the sound of what the enemy is telling us. And see, God is raising up a remnant of people who are going to put their head between their knees and start listening to the sound of heaven. Listen to what heaven is saying. You know, the sound of the rustling in the mulberry bushes, not the sound of the enemy the sound of what God is doing. God is moving. God is going forth, and he's doing mighty things. There's one situation in our lives that I've been praying about and praying about, and the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of our God. I'm not going to have to do anything. If I'm listening to the sound of heaven, there's already a sound of rustling in the mulberry bush. Whatever you've been praying for, you need to get your ears tuned to the sound of heaven because there's a sound of something in the heavenlies. Even in this city, I've been praying over the youth in this city and it doesn't look real good right now, but when I tune in to the sound of heaven, oh, I hear the sound of rustling in the mulberry bushes. God is working and moving. He's on the way. He is sending in his heavenly host. There is a sound of revival in the heavenlies. There's a sound of God's spirit being poured out in the heavenlies. So when we look toward the ocean, there is a rising, a small hand. out of God is going to pour it out. God is going to pour out his spirit. Can you hear the sound of it? Can you hear the sound? See, if you seek God, he will give you information that you shouldn't have. But he gives you that so that you will go and tell Kings and queens, go prepare your chariot. You're about to get hit with some rain. God is going to give you a message. He's going to give you something that you can proclaim to the generation. God is going to show you confidential, classified information. So that's the second thing that happens when you seek the Lord. The third thing is you will live. God says when you seek him, you will live. Seek ye me and you shall live. That live means revive, give, promise, restore. How many of us need restoration? How many people in the body of Christ need to recover? They've been battered and beat up by the enemy. And God's warning his people to live. John 1, 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus is life. You know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is past, and everything is fresh and new. The Amplified says, Behold, the fresh and new has come. In Jesus is life. And Romans 6, 11 says, Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin and your relation to it broken, but alive to God in Christ. I thought that was so interesting in the Amplified. Consider yourself dead to sin and your relation to it broken. It's time to break that relationship. It's time to cut the ties. It's time to cut the ties of your relationship with sin because all it's producing is death. But alive, 
living in unbroken fellowship with him. Unbroken fellowship with him. That's the Amplified says. And it goes back to that meaning of seek. It's a frequent tread. It's a, something that you do continuously. Seeking God. It's not a one-time thing. It's to tread frequently. And it's even reiterated in Romans. That's how we remain alive to God. We live in unbroken fellowship with him. Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're the branches. You know, our whole substance comes from Christ. Our whole vitality comes from Christ. It becomes him and not us. So I wanted to read a part of a devotional I read out of Spurgeon. Um, I have a morning and evening daily devotional. And this one was actually for January the 2nd, but I came upon it this week. And it's just a couple of key points that I thought were so good, and it's pertinent to what we're talking about. He said, your life cannot be sustained without renewal from God. I know this is so simple, but we need to hear it every day. Your life cannot be sustained without renewal from God. How poor and malnourished are the saints who live without the diligent use of the word of God and secret prayer. Man, we remain so poor and malnourished. I can tell when I haven't been in the Word enough. I feel so dry. I hate that feeling. You get to where you hate it because you get used to being in God's presence and you get used to His Word. And when you start feeling dry, mm -mm, I don't like this. I got. It. I'll just start saying something out loud. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I need His Word. How poor and malnourished are the saints who live without the diligent use of the Word of God and secret prayer. Without restoration, we are not ready for the perpetual assaults of hell or the stern afflictions of heaven or even our inner strife. We're not ready. Without seeking God, without that restoration that comes from seeking, we're not ready for the assaults of hell. And I'm telling you, they are there. They are so strong. I mean, Satan is building. I don't know how the, I don't know how the powers of darkness know things, but they do. There's some kind of communication of the Spirit that we're not aware of. But they know when God's about to do something in your life because they'll break all the hordes of hell against you. That's how I know. I've learned to tell when something good's about to happen in my life because Satan will fight me. It'll, it'll be a terrible battle. And I'll say, okay, it's a dark night, but joy's coming in the morning. And you can always tell what God is determining for your life. But what the enemy says about you, you just believe the opposite. Just believe the opposite of whatever. I mean, really, pinpoint in your life what the enemy's telling you. You're not going to make it. You're so tired. Your body is, is just worn down. And I, those voices will come, and I'll say, okay, I have strength in Jesus' name. I have victory in Jesus' name. There's a reason why the enemy wants to discourage you, because when you get so heavy under that blanket of discouragement, you won't seek God. And we need that restoration. So I just want to encourage you, seek God, because without this continual, perpetual treading in God's presence, you are not ready for the assault that comes from hell. The more I immerse myself in his word, I get hungrier and hungrier for him. The more I, I thirst more and more for him as I pursue him. And the more I know him, the more I want to know. It's a continual thing. When you seek him, he just continues to give you more hunger and more thirst. Because the more that you see, the more that you want to see. The more you love him, the more you want to love him. And so I wanted to read one more thing before I close. And this is also out of another devotional. Talking about the life of Christ. Seek me and you will live. And it's not just that God wants to fill you with life just so you'll feel good and be vitalized. He wants the life of Jesus to flow from you to others. He wants the life of God to flow from you to a hurting and dying world. And so thinking about the life of Christ, this devotional from Smith Wigglesworth, he talks about the life of God within us. His life is manifested power overflowing. That's what the life of Christ is. It is manifested power overflowing. Isn't that what you want in your life? I want the manifest power of God overflowing. We must decrease if the life of God is to be manifested. There is not room for two kinds of life in one body. Death for life.
price to pay for this manifested power of God through you. We don't have room for two kinds of lives. You know, the, the enemy and the world and our culture, they try to show and present a sinful life as living it up. I pointed out to Ezra the other day, all the beer commercials, they look like they're having such a good time. You know, oh, it's the life of the party. And I said, Ezra, that's not, they're not showing the true face of alcoholism and drug use. They're not going to show you that because that's what it's meant to do, entice you. You can't have two kind of lives going on. There's not room for that. As you die to human desire, there comes a fellowship within, perfected cooperation. You cease and God increases. God in you is a living substance, a spiritual nature. You live by another life. You live by faith in the Son of God. As the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus, he is real. The living word, effective, acting, speaking, thinking, praying, singing. Oh, it is a wonderful life. The substance of the word of God, which includes possibility and opportunity, which confronts you, bringing you to a place undaunted. So he gives us that power. In God, there is limitless possibilities. In God, you know, the world can only offer you so much. You know, you get the fame and the fortune, and then what? Then what happens? With God, there are limitless possibilities. So we must live in his holy word. We must rejoice in the manifestation of the life of God on behalf of a sick and perishing world. We need to manifest this overflowing power of God. So we need to abide in Christ. We need to abide in him. Because that's where we're going to receive this overflowing power. He also notes, lose all your identity in the Son of God. Let him become all in all. Seek only the Lord and let him be glorified. You will have gifts. You will have grace. You will have wisdom. God is waiting for the person who will lay all on the altar, 52 weeks of the year, 365 days of the year, and then walk perpetually in the Holy Spirit. That's my desire. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and you will live. Seek God. If you want power in your life, if you want this vitality, if you're tired of struggling, seek him every single day. This is a place where you should tread frequently. This is where we receive the power of God, the overflowing manifestation of the life of Jesus in our lives. And that's what I want for my life. And so I'm going to ask you, this is a rhetorical question, of course, Will you commit to seeking God this week? He has a message for you. He has a word for you to bring to somebody this week. He has a word for you to bring to a hurting and dying world. Seek him. Let the world recognize that Lori has been with Jesus this week. Jim has been with Jesus. Ray, Linda, all of us. Let the world see they've been with Jesus. Seek the Lord. And so as I pray, let's commit to that this week. Seek God. I know know you're busy. I know that there's not a lot of time in the day. I have found this week that as I have taken the time to seek him, that he's redeemed my time. I've been able to do more than I normally can get done because when you honor God, he'll honor you. So seek the Lord this week. He's got a message for you, so I am excited and expecting I can't wait to hear the message next week. I can't wait to hear what God is showing you. I can't wait for it to get to a place where every week, everybody in this room has something that God has shown him or her. I'm excited about that. So as I pray, let's commit to seeking God. I want the manifest power of the life of Christ flowing in and through me. Amen? So, Father, we thank you for this day. We commit to seek you, God. I commit to seek you this week. I commit to get in your word and to pray. God, I commit to look for you this week, to seek you, to call upon you, to pursue you this week. I commit, Father, my life to a continual pursuit.
of who you are. And I thank you that your word says that as we do that, there's a promise attached. You will answer. We will find you. And we praise you for that. I speak a blessing on every person in this room. And I pray that you will impart to each person a hunger and a new desire for you, God. A new life, a new vitality in their lives that it'll be overflowing. And we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And we pray these things in agreement this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.